Uh, good morning. I'd like to welcome members to the fourth meeting in uh, 2018 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Uh, we have apologies this morning from Elaine Smith, MSP. Um, agenda item one is business in private. Um, can the committee agree to take agenda item four in private? This is an item on the budget process. Yes. Thank you. Um, agenda item two is sexual harassment and inappropriate conduct and the committee's inquiry into this area. Joining us today are Maurice Golden, business manager for the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, Rhoda Grant, business manager for the Scottish Labour Party, Patrick Harvey, business manager for the Scottish Green Party, Bill Kidd, chief whip for the Scottish National Party, and Willie Rainey, business manager for the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us this morning. Um, I'm going to start off uh, the committee's questioning and uh, looking at the area of the um, Parliament's survey results which were published last week. Um, and they revealed uh, amongst those who'd experienced sexual harassment that 45% uh, of those said the perpetrator was an MSP. MSPs make up fewer than 8% of those issued with the survey. And I'd like to ask the panel, um, why do you think this was the case? What were the reasons for this? Who'd like to start? <laughs> um, I'll be perfectly happy, thank you. Um, I think that it's a salutary lesson for everyone in the Scottish Parliament to hear these sort of figures, actually. I, I think um, that we really need to be looking at the processes uh, of, of each of the parties, but also of the Parliament, in terms of how best we can address such <laughs> significant figures. Um, and I think that it's uh, incumbent on all MSPs who are the people elected here, uh, trust put in them by the people of their constituencies and the people of Scotland, to ensure that we set a, a high benchmark and uh, for society in general. And I think we're letting people down to some extent with those figures. And I think that um, we do need to ensure that in future and, and in the close near future as well, going forward, that um, we can turn those figures around and make people feel safe and comfortable coming to their work. And whoever they happen to be employed by is going to have a duty of care to them. Um, I think those figures let us all down and uh, it's, it's a salutary lesson for us. Patrick? Uh, thank you, convener. I, I think we should be deeply concerned, but probably unsurprised by some of the, the findings of the survey. I think we've seen in many walks of life, whether in the public eye or out of the public eye, that the abuse of power is uh, is part of this, this dynamic. Uh, I don't think we, that we should be surprised that if power is abused in, in a workplace, uh, in show business, in uh, religious organisations, in, in any of the other organisations where we've seen uh, scandals come out and a, a growing recognition of, uh, of a problem that's intolerable, I don't think we should be surprised that it's the case in politics as well. Um, so, you know, I, I think all of us need to take a collective responsibility, not just for the scale of the problem, but for the power dynamics involved and... Uh, and that obviously has a, a relevance to, to political life where uh, elected office and uh, and in particular those who are protected from the, the kind of consequences that might come to, to bear in other workplaces, uh, you know, that's that's an unavoidable reality at the moment of, of political life, but it's something we need to take responsibility for uh, in designing the, the processes and systems that we use to respond to the problem. Rhoda? Um, I I find the findings deeply disappointing. I think we all had a higher degree of expectation from our colleagues, and I think those figures are, are, are quite stark. I suppose what we have to do is try and drill down into those figures, because it doesn't mean that 8% of MSPs are doing this. 
but it means that they're responsible for 8% of the, uh, sorry, 45% of MSPs are doing this, um, because it, it means that it could be one person, and I think if you drill down into the report, you will see that it was seldom one incident that was being reported, it was quite often a number of incidents, and sometimes almost a perpetual bad behaviour. So. What we find quite often is one person abusing their power, maybe two people abusing their power, and I suppose we're no different um, than any other walk of life in that. But we need to make sure that people have the, the comfort to come forward and report that, because the chances are we're speaking about a minority of people who are abusing the power and the position that they've been put in, and they need to be dealt with to stop that behaviour recurring. So I think what we need to do as a parliament is create the right circumstances for people to feel um, empowered to come forward and, and get the right support. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was uh, shocked and uh, surprised uh, by the results. I think uh, Rhoda makes uh, a very good point in the sense that if it is indeed a, num a small number and tiny proportion of individuals perpetrating those acts, then that's quite a different issue than having a culture um, that is the problem. And my sense in Parliament overall, although I appreciate that it, within individual parties that culture could vary, but my impression of Parliament coming in as a new parliamentarian is that the culture in this institution is that of similar to, to other public bodies. You know, for example, those I've got experience of, you know, people like Scottish Enterprise or Scottish Natural Heritage, it's that culture. Now, that doesn't mean that there, there couldn't be issues, but there isn't a, a cultural issue to address. That would be my sense from my experience uh, in Parliament. Therefore, in terms of how you then look to deal with those uh, issues, what processes that we can put in place as parties and indeed as parliament, then um, the steps that has been taken over the past few months are, are something to be welcomed in terms of s making sure that everybody is aware uh, and actively um, and, and helping people where there is an issue to, to, to look to address that in an appropriate manner. I suspect it might actually shake us from our complacency a little bit because we did believe we were better. We thought that Westminster was the place where it all happened and up here somehow because we had a different culture, a different approach, we're a new institution, that we weren't subject to that. And I think hopefully it might have just shaken everybody up a little bit to, to actually test their procedures and make sure that we're we're understanding what kind of culture we have established here. Uh, now, I accept all the points that have been made. It might be one person, it might be a number of people, but it's the fact that there's 45% of experience that does show that it's quite uh, a widespread issue. So we do need to try and uh, review our procedures and make sure we've got it, got it right. The response rate, however, to the survey was quite high. I mean, the Westminster survey response rate was quite low and therefore I think the authenticity of it was probably less. But here it was quite high, so perhaps it's even more reflective um, of actually what is happening. Now, I was in Westminster before. Um, I was there for four years, so I experienced both cultures. And the late-night voting culture of having to be there till 10 o'clock, um, I'm not saying everybody goes to drink, but everybody goes for a meal, and there's an awful lot more socialising than perhaps there is here. So you would think there was... Uh, more propensity for it to happen down there. But the fact that these figures are so high, I think, should give us a bit of a wake-up call to look again at our procedures. So, going back to the, the survey again, the, the most um, common response amongst those who had experienced inappropriate behaviour was to take no action. Um, why do you believe people are so reluctant to come forward when they've, they've experienced this type of behaviour? Can I say something? Oh, please. Yeah. I had a think about this um, um, because I've obviously spoken to quite a, a number of members of staff um, over the past few months um, about the issue and I think some people might feel because previously as has just been said by Wally there earlier um, that you know this the culture is mindset is different here um, that maybe they're if they have experienced something they were on their own or they were alone and they didn't know 
that there were other people in a similar circumstance, and that makes it much more difficult for them to come forward and, and say something. And maybe, hopefully, um, certainly the survey has uncovered some figures which are higher than, than obviously, we'd have hoped, but certainly higher than I thought. Um, that sort of uh, might open people's uh, ideas up about the it's the right thing to do is to come and, and make representation about it, make a complaint if necessary, but let people know that this is happening um, because it, it's these type of horrible things happen uh, in, you know, in recesses um, you know, away from the public eye and if we can bring it into the public eye then I think that can help to address it and reduce it significantly. Um, I, I feel really bad about people keeping this to themselves and being afraid of actually saying anything. Um, I, I suppose I would mention three factors. One which is uh, relevant to the whole of our society uh, is that there has been a, a, a sense of simply putting up with the, the endemic nature of uh, sexual harassment and sexist and sexually entitled behaviour. Um, part of the reason why this inquiry is happening is that there is a mood afoot that time is up on this uh, and there's a, a need for, for change and a, a, a refusal to tolerate it. But that has been the case throughout our society, not just in this country but around the world, a, a sense of, of uh, women in particular simply you know, feeling that they have to live their lives with the expectation that this is normal. Well, if we're saying now this is not normal, we need to recognise that that's a moment for change in our, in our culture. The two particular factors that I would mention that I think are relevant to, to this parliament as an institution uh, that might be inhibiting factors, additional inhibiting factors to, to people reporting. Uh, one is around loyalty. Uh, most people working in the political part of parliament, I'm not necessarily talking about SPCB staff or officials or, uh, or what have you, but within the political part of parliament, most people have a sense of, of loyalty and commitment to the party group uh, or to the politicians that they're working with. And the, there will be a, a sense of, of um, feeling that there's a, a reluctance to, to do something that would damage a, an organisation that, that people are here because of a personal and a, and a sincere commitment to. And I think for me that's a, an additional reason why Parliament having its own procedures for reporting neutrally that don't rely on people uh, raising an issue inside a political party should be able to do that absolutely if they wish to, but they need to have the additional option of a neutral, non-party political route uh, to, to raise these, these matters. The, the second factor that's particular here, of course, is around scrutiny. And if, if an issue, as we've seen recently, becomes high profile and becomes the subject of, of public comment, uh, that may be an, an additional inhibiting factor. People may simply not want to face going through that uh, and having it potentially drag on for months uh, and, and affect their, their lives and, and prevent them from being able to get on with their lives. Um, there's probably not a simple solution to that, uh, but I, I think having quick resolution to, to, to complaints that are raised uh, will help, uh, you know, rather than uh, allowing the, the perception that if you raise an issue, it's, it's going to dominate your life for, for months and months. Well done. I, I think it's down to power dynamics because people use and abuse their power to, to harass other people. So they are picking on people that they hope aren't going to come forward because they are senior to them. And I think that happens in most walks of life. There's also another issue, I think, that um, really impacts on the parliament in that MSPs are the employer of their own staff. So we have a grievance procedure in our contracts of employment for our staff, but we are the employer. So if you have a grievance about your employer, there's very little place to go. You're also employed by that person. The parliament or the party doesn't have any um, locus over that. Or So if you're going to complain about an MSP who is your employer, you're going to be worried about the roof over your head are you going to be able to continue to work for that person if that relationship totally breaks down? And I would argue that that relationship has already broken down if you're being harassed and treated that way by your employer. So I think as a parliament, we need to look at that dynamic and see 
um, what protections we can build into the way we employ staff that protect people from having to make the choice of reporting or losing the roof over their head, which is, is pretty stark. People also need to know that they're being believed. And if it's a power dynamic again, the person is senior to them, they're probably well respected, so people are maybe concerned that they won't be heard. And just picking up on the point that Patrick made about loyalty to party and maybe a, a bit afraid to raise this because you know it's going to cause um, bad headlines for the party that you're committed to as a member of staff. And I, I would just, I suppose, suggest a difference. If that person is harassing you, they will probably be harassing a number of other people, and that is more reputationally damaging to the political party that you're loyal to. So if you're loyal to that party, it's it's almost uh, incumbent on you to, to weed out that really bad behaviour to protect your party. So I'd put that as another option. But I know if you're talking about your employer, then it becomes very, very difficult because people need to have a roof over their head, they need to eat. And most of the time, I would imagine that people will seek alternative employment to get themselves out of that situation and maybe never report it. So I think that's the crux of the matter, especially with MSPs, that we need to, to wrestle with and deal with. I think that, I mean, an additional point to add, I think that the vast ma majority of people in Parliament haven't chosen to work in public life, and I think that is an obvious and clear barrier in terms of the confidentiality of uh, reporting uh, an incident, because uh, given that the vast majority of people haven't chosen to be in the newspapers, then to report and to have journalists wanting to hear your story well to be fair to lots of people they might not want to put themselves in that position and I completely understand that and that almost links to the second point which is confidence in the process in terms of how that is dealt with and you know from my perspective that has to be dealt with confidentiality um, uh, for, for both individuals as much to protect the individual as anything else and I think that ensuring that the, the process is robust is absolutely critical to uh, ensuring that then the incidents uh, are reported. Um, separate to this, but um, prior to the, um, uh, these revelations coming out, I proactively contacted all um, the Conservative members of staff to say if there was any issue at all, then I was available um, uh, to, to speak to them. Um, again, not specifically on this topic, but just on any topic, including other grievance procedures uh, uh, and anything else. And I think that's something that, that can be helpful in terms of ensuring that individuals will report because they have confidence in the, the system and the process that will follow. I don't think I've got much more to add, but I mean, just reflecting on when the Me Too initiative kind of broke, it was like a dam bursting where people felt all of a sudden they could speak and be heard and they were respected for it. And perhaps through this process, we may get a bit of a dam bursting in the parliament where the kind of balance between damage limitation, which is often a focus of a political party when there's negative publicity around and actually doing the right thing um, is tilted more in favour of doing the right thing uh, rather than just damage limitation, which inevitably is what an awful lot of political parties are, are focused on. So uh, I think I agree with all the points that have been made, and I think particularly Morris's last point about you know, an awful lot of people who work in here didn't really come in to come into the spotlight, um, and therefore you know, dealing with a sexual harassment case is bad enough, but to have to tell the newspapers at the same time when you're, air, you know, you're washing your dirty linen in public is quite a difficult thing to do. So uh, I, I completely agree with Morris's last point, and that, that's why I think we need to provide easier paths for people to, to make the complaint and be dealt with in a, in a, in a sensitive way. Of the fact that so few people who have experienced harassment actually take action. Two of the themes that we've heard over the last few weeks is that it can be because they don't know what the procedures are or when they know what the procedures are, they don't have confidence in them. So moving on to your party's procedures, what might stop people currently from coming forward 
in light of what your procedures are right now and what action have you taken of any over the last few weeks as parties to raise awareness of the procedures or to actually change the procedures in particular if I could turn the focus on one area and that is who their first port of call is so if their first port of call is an MSP that strikes me as a bit of a problem A variety of different channels that, that members of staff can choose. I mean, the business manager, me, is one of them, um, but the ethical standards commissioner is another, and then the party, because of our experience in recent years, um, we set up a pastoral care officer who's a UK-wide person who, although is employed by the party, is clearly been seen by people in the party as being separate from the management structure, so is respected as such. Now, we did that two or three years ago, and it seems to be have bedded in reasonably well. Now, of course, we're prepared to review that because some people have suggested you could have an independent person outside of the party who would actually conduct that role. We, we are, we are wanting to stay with this procedure, which is relatively new for now, to see how it settles in. Um, but we have set up a number of different channels, so business manager, ethical standards, but also through to the pastoral care officer. And the pastoral care officer actually gets uh, reasonably regular correspondence about a number of different issues. So there seem to be a major part of the party structure. And is that, how's, how's that been circulated? How, how are um, all members of the party aware of that? Well, well the, I mean, everybody's received um, a letter. It was from Mike Rumbles when he was business manager uh, at the time, but they've received it with it all sets out very, very clearly in a short letter. And actually also then specifies how do you define bullying and harassment as well. So we think it's pretty transparent uh, for members of staff. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's uh, what was uh, described by uh, Willie Rennie there actually is uh, a, a logical approach. The approach in the SNP um, is also, I hope, reasonably logical. Um, I'm the chief whip in the Scottish, uh, in the SNP um, group in the Scottish Parliament, um, but we have a team of whips and they're not all men. Um, so on that basis, I, I'm hopeful that if people feel uncomfortable, about maybe going and speaking to someone about, and who, of, you know, who's a man, if it's a woman that's got the issue, uh, might uh, find it easier um, to find someone to speak to. Um, there has to be, and I'm not uh, trying to, because I'm going to say something more about how the party operates things in, in the Scottish Parliament, but um, I think uh, there is and should be a sort of camaraderie element as well, where people don't feel as if they're just isolated and they've got no one to talk to because they sit in their own wee box in an office or something like that. There's a mixing uh, goes on, and I know for a fact that um, when people have had um, issues with um, an MSP or someone else that um, I've heard about it not directly from that person first in the first instance but from others who've spoken on their behalf um, because the person as was mentioned earlier might find it um, something that they're embarrassed about or something that they're worried about um, whether because of their job or because of the focus of attention that might shift on to them um, so that does happen, um, but, but that's anecdotal to some extent. In terms of um, in terms of party, um, all uh, staff, all SNP staff, and uh, all of the parliaments where we have uh, SNP representation, and at the SNP's headquarters, uh, received a letter from Nicola Sturgeon uh, as party leader, and um, within that was outlined uh, the duties of care, which. Um, we all have to each other, uh, but also um, a person, um, a name, a named person um, who's a solicitor with the firm of lawyers used by the SNP, um, who people can can go to and report things, and also out with um, Parliament, uh, that uh, solicitors out with Parliament, but also out with Parliament. There's a point of contact at the SNP headquarters, which is the party clerk. Um, so there are people out with the group of um, MSPs where uh, SNP members um, are allowed to go and encouraged to go if they feel that there's any issue. Thanks. Um, 
if I could start on the party side, uh, first of all, from the, the Scottish Green Party's perspective, you'll be aware that we've gone through a huge amount of change over recent years. Um, since 2014, our membership is uh, much bigger than it, than it used to be. And so we've been trying to review and, and reform a great deal about how we organise the, the party. Um, the number of elections and referendums that have come along since then has delayed some of that, but actually on the on the uh, conduct and complaints side of things, we've made more progress than, than on other things. We used to have a system where um, uh, what I would describe as a slightly arcane uh, process took too long uh, to resolve uh, issues, and that, that refers to the, the first part of your question, one of the reasons uh, that people would be unhappy uh, to, to take part in a process or to, to raise an issue internally within the party is around the length of time that it can take. Um, the, the process also involved not just some elected members of the party, but also random selection of, of party members uh, in, the, in the sense of a jury, uh, if you like, uh, for, for certain kinds of circumstances. And again, that gave rise to lots of problems around uh, people having access to the right amount of support or understanding of issues uh, and, and timescales. Uh, recently, we have done away with that system and uh, set up a new process whereby each local branch appoints a welfare and conduct officer. Uh, that has to be somebody who doesn't have any other position within the party, uh, whether as, as an officer or a candidate or, or anything like that. That group then, uh, across all those branches, they work together uh, and our, our National uh, Conduct and Complaints Committee is developing new processes. Now, the, uh, the, the policy that was to be put in place was to go to our party council meeting, which was cancelled because of the bad weather the other week, but that was the, the meeting at which we were supposed to put in place new procedures for the, uh, the, the, the interim period between the old system going out and the new one coming in. So basically, we're in the middle of, of quite a, an extensive redesign of how we deal with all matters to do with complaints, conduct, uh, uh, and the welfare of, of our party members. Once that's in place, our parliamentary group will more than likely uh, apply that in the same way that a branch would, by having one person who doesn't hold another office, so it wouldn't be an MSP, acting as a, as a welfare and conduct officer uh, and tying into to the rest of the party. Uh, if a complaint goes through that process, that would involve our operations manager, that's our senior staff member, working with uh, two of the elected committees, our standing orders committee and our operations committee, uh, to develop processes that were right for each circumstance. For a small political group, uh, you'll be aware we don't have a big team of whips, uh, as what might be relevant in, uh, in the SNP group, for example, uh, and so we would be very keen that uh, it, a, a, an issue could be resolved without relying on somebody who is either involved in or a close colleague of uh, the, the person who is being complained about. So we would be keen to uh, make sure that that tapped into the, the party's uh, external processes. I would just add one final caveat, though, which is one of the themes that I know the committee has discussed uh, is around the, the lack of a, a, an ultimate backstop of, of, of an MSP uh, not being able to be dismissed from their job. Now, if complaints like this all go through political parties, uh, I, I fear that we may still be in a position where that backstop isn't possible because the outcome of an investigation uh, needs to be available to a body that has the authority to make a decision uh, around disciplining a member to the point of, uh, of, of expulsion or, or removal from office. A political party would not be in that position. And that, again, leaves me asking, should we be expecting people to go through party procedures uh, in these kind of circumstances for the most serious issues where you would want a, a serious disciplinary option to be available? Uh, it seems to me that needs to be tapping into uh, an independent and official process uh, for, for disciplining MSPs, not necessarily a, a party, because that, that may not have the option of, of taking that kind of disciplinary measure. 
Um, we have a formal process which the committee have a copy of. We also, I think in recognition, and I think everyone recognises that a formal process is probably not the first port of call for somebody experiencing this. Um, we also have a contract with Rape Crisis for a confidential helpline for people to, to contact. We're also clear that we need to do as much as we can to support people and encourage them to, to come forward. So we have reminded staff that they can contact our leader or our group exec members. So that is a range of five different people that they can contact within the party group. So I know people might be reluctant to contact someone who they see as a friend of the person they're complaining about, but to give them enough variety of people that they can contact and raise the issue with, I think is really important. And they can also raise the issue with the general secretary of our party. So there are a number of routes in. Um, there is also the police, you know, sexual assault is a crime. And, you know, if people are facing that, they, they don't necessarily have to go through a party procedure. They can report that to the police. And indeed, if anyone is disclosing um, behaviour that falls into that category, I would, I would be suggesting they should be encouraging them to do that. But I think what's most important is to get beside the person and support them because it's quite a frightening place, especially if you feel your, your, your life, your, your work is being affected by this. So it's really important to have people beside them, helping them, supporting them through the process, but also allowing them to be in charge of the steps they take. I think that's really important as well. Thanks. Uh, I think that there's, within the Conservative group, there's widespread knowledge of uh, how to report uh, an incident. There's a number of channels in which um, any individual could do that. There's a confidential phone line, there's a confidential email address, and there's, if you like, slightly more informal mechanisms via myself as Chief Whip and Business Manager, the Director of the Party, or indeed, and this isn't specifically on this topic, but we do have uh, staff reps in Holyrood that individuals um, uh, can go to and we also have uh, trained uh, mental health members of staff as well so you know there's a number of routes that people could choose to follow in terms of uh, this particular topic but actually a whole range of, uh, of, of other uh, issues that uh, could be raised um, and I think I certainly have confidence in that code of conduct and th the system in terms of uh, how it would work. I think we'd need to be very careful about how a, if you like, non-party system was uh, put in place and how that would work. And an example I would use on that front would be, and this would be my concern uh, on this topic if we put in a another uh, a, another system which wasn't um, from the parties. At the Scottish parliamentary elections, uh, the uh, once everyone was elected, member from an, another uh, party put in a claim to the police that there'd been a dispute over uh, uh, irregular election expenses, then immediately phoned the journalists who then uh, managed to confirm that the individual was being investigated on a breach of election rules and that story ran for six months until the police dropped the case. Now if you're in a situation like this for MSPs and where it's a vexatious claim they would somehow need to be protected from that were they to be deemed not guilty and if individual parties were choosing to make vexatious claims about individual MSPs, then that would do two things. One, it's very uh, inappropriate for the individual MSPs, but actually, if we f remember why we're all here, it's to make sure that individuals have confidence in the system, that they can be kept uh, confidential if they want it, and actually we deal with the issues around sexual harassment and bullying, and I'm not convinced that uh, another system uh, would necessarily solve that and that needs to be the focus of any recommendations uh, on behalf of the parties or indeed from this committee. 
a really brief supplementary and perhaps just one or two could answer. If there was a situation involving individuals from two or more parties, what's the solution? I, th I think, for instance, if it were someone accusing an MSP of my own party and, and maybe, maybe a member of staff from your own party, I would believe that both parties would work together. I would expect your party to be supporting your member of staff and giving them that. And I would expect our party to be taking that very seriously and dealing with the perpetrator of that abuse. I don't think this is party political. I don't think anyone would use this. It's much too serious to be used as a party political kind of game playing. I think it's in all our interests to, to weed it out and m make sure that happens. And if that means us all working together, I think we, we certainly will. And I would have no, no problem whatsoever in working with another party if I thought one of my members was causing that kind of, or perpetrating that kind of abuse to anybody, certainly within the parliament or at another party. Okay. Yeah, to if that's okay. Um, yeah, thanks, because it's an important question. I agree entirely with Rhoda. It's, um, uh, I am absolutely definite that um, between parties or even across the parties, um, we would work together in order to address such a challenge. Um, but I do believe that the parliamentary authorities are very helpful when it comes to issues such as this as well um, and helping to bring us um, together uh, in order to resolve such an issue. And I know for a fact that, um, that the Chief Executive's Office, the HR Department, would be very willing to actually provide support should these situations happen. Thank you. I'm just going to move on to, to Mr Arthur. Can I, can I ask the panel members if they could keep their answers slightly shorter? I know we all like to talk. Um, Mr Arthur. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to the panel. I would like to pick up on a point that Patrick Harvey raised, and that is the issue of an ultimate sanction. Clearly, this has a, a very significant bearing on the confidence of any um, complaints process. And given the unique nature of an, an MSP's employment, whereby they can only ultimately be disqualified um, for acts that um, reach a threshold of criminality, and uh, whereas in other occupations where dismissal could occur for acts of gross misconduct, that doesn't necessarily apply for MSPs. So I would like to hear um, the views of the panel on the issue of a, an ultimate sanction, potentially how that could be administered, um, and also any specific thoughts on the power of recall um, in relation to these matters. Can I kick off? Um, I mean, I, I've been a, quite a long-term advocate of having a system of recall. You need to be careful that it's not being used for political motives, that it's based on disciplinary issues. But I think the Westminster system that they've come up with, which is a combination of different thresholds that have to be met, including a public threshold, would be an appropriate one to do. So the Westminster recall system is based on if you've received a prison sentence of less than 12 months, because if you're over 12 months, you're automatically excluded. If it's less than 12 months, if you've had a, a suspension from the Standards Committee in Westminster or through IPSA, the expenses body at Westminster, if you've been found to put in misleading or fraudulent expense claims, then those are the three triggers. Then you would have the, um, the speaker would issue uh, a notice for a petition and would have to raise the support of 10% of the electorate in that constituency. Now, because we've got a different electoral system with the regional lists, obviously we need to take that into account. But we'd also need to consider whether those were the right thresholds internally. So it's not a, a free for all. It's not something that, you know, you, um, just, a, a, a politically motivated group of people could go out there to try and oust an MSP that they happen to disagree with politically. It would have to have met a number of different thresholds. And I think that would in some way help us to police ourselves in certain circumstances. Um, I mean, we, we've had uh, a number of individual cases, which I won't mention uh, in the parliament, um, going back a number of years as well, and we've felt helpless to be able to do anything about it. So I would support a system of recall being introduced here 
I think we need to look at the Westminster system. I think we need to understand whether those were the right hurdles, the right thresholds to be met. But I think it is worthy of, of consideration. Um, I, um, I would have serious concerns about that. Uh, I can see uh, a case for uh, a system of recall in relation to political matters. Uh, if, for example, uh, the constituents of an MSP were so angry at a political decision that the MSP had made, perhaps uh, uh, conflicting with their, their manifesto commitments or their, uh, their, their, their stated policy, uh, I, can, I can see that the constituents in that case uh, might say that they have, have a democratic right to, to change their decision about the election of that MSP. Having th this kind of recall process in relation specifically to issues like sexual harassment does seem to me inevitably to turn the matter into a public campaign. Even if the, the threshold that's been reached uh, is around disciplinary uh, matters that have been properly investigated, and even where the intention has nothing to do uh, with the, the political matters, uh, or the political identity or, or, or affiliation of the uh, of the MSP, even where it's not being used for that that kind of vexatious uh, motivation, but being used for the right motivation, we would still ultimately be turning what should be a disciplinary matter uh, and uh, a serious one at that into a a public campaign at the ballot box. Ultimately, now I'm not suggesting for a moment that the Scottish political landscape uh, should be compared directly to that of the US, but we've seen elsewhere uh, the, the situation where someone bragging about uh, committing sexual assault can win high office. Um, it would also exacerbate two existing problems uh, that are inhibiting or that may inhibit people from, from raising a complaint, one being turning the issue uh, that they're complaining about into something that dominates their life and, and makes this very, very high profile, uh, and also a, a lack of consistency in what the actual disciplinary consequences of the action being complained about are. Uh, people need to have confidence uh, that uh, unacceptable behaviour will be dealt with properly and consistently, uh, and I would have concerns that a, a recall mechanism would not achieve that. I think there is a, a far stronger case for reviewing the disqualification criteria which currently exist uh, and uh, ensuring that we're, like in any other workplace, uh, where certain standards of behaviour uh, have, uh, have been failed, uh, there is a, a disciplinary process which can result in somebody being dismissed on, on grounds of uh, gross misconduct or something similar, and, and I think that that should be taken outside of the political process. Yes, I think there has to be a process to deal with people who have committed what will be crimes and, uh, and abused their power. Um, I don't think on political issues people people are elected and they go to the ballot, they're re-elected re again every five years and that's when people make a judgment about their political ideals. But there has to be a process to deal with somebody whose behaviour has fallen short and it shouldn't be a political process, it shouldn't be a public process. There should be a stand, you know, we have standards commissioners and the like that look at people's behaviour. So we should be looking at that system to see if there are ways when a case is proved against a person and their behaviour has fallen way short of what we would expect from an elected representative that there are steps that can be taken. Um, just more generally on recall, I think with the list system, it doesn't lend itself to that uh, particularly well. Um, given that in many regions, you know, irrespective of what any individual MSP had done, there will be enough voters of the other party uh, to ensure that you know a, a number of uh, petitioners would would be reached. Um, I think we need to make the distinction between uh, matters that are subject for disciplinary action and ma matters that are subject for. Uh, criminal and ultimately criminal convictions because they're quite different and there could be cases where criminality is seen in a political sense to be justified so for example um, with you know the campaigns against Trident 
you know, where people felt they were doing the uh, consciously objecting to something, and as a result of that, uh, political consciousness ended up with a criminal conviction. So we need to, you know, concern ourselves with that. I think where it's a, a disciplinary matter, then uh, it needs to be dealt with uh, by uh, the party it, itself, and uh, that should be proportionate to, to the act as well. Thank you very much for the question. <clears throat> I think it's important, as has been said by everyone um, so far, that um, <clears throat> what we're doing now is looking at the perpetrator rather than the, the victim, should I put it that way. And um, it's important that we don't just say that was a bad thing to do, don't do it again. Um, that doesn't fill anybody with much confidence. So we do have to take um, some a direction in terms of disciplinary matters um, seriously. I Perhaps this is something which um, requires the parties all working together, maybe through the SPCB, um, to try and look at how we can take this forward and uh, what would work best <coughs> in our parliament. Um, you know, borrowing from, uh, from other parliaments' experience and maybe even coming up with some new uh, ideas um, as to how we handle um, the, the future prospects of those who have either, uh, either committed um, gross misconduct or indeed criminal acts. Um, and we need to figure a sort of a, possibly a, a hierarchical system of um, response from the parliament and from the parties for that. Um, I think it's something that uh, we, we really haven't looked deeply enough into as yet, and maybe this uh, could be the first stepping stone to doing so. Okay. Uh, Alexander. Thank you. Confidentiality was identified as one of the big issues when we took evidence, and also the survey has touched on that, and there's a lack of confidence uh, in victims about how it would be treated and the support they would receive. Uh, and that's come through uh, already. Now, what are your parties doing to manage that? And are you actually giving support, uh, externally support from the party to, to, to try and bridge that gap of the confidentiality? Because if people believe it's, it's being managed by the party and, and they don't have the confidence in dealing with that, uh, what support mechanisms have you put in place to try and ensure that outside sources can support you and can support the victim to have more confidence in the process? Yeah, um, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> uh, as far as the SNP group um, and as far as the SNP is concerned, um, the, the decent and uh, caring approach um, which everyone would like to see, um, we hope that we are taking forward in terms of support um, for complete confidentiality for those um, who are complainants of uh, misdemeanours against them. Um, we have, um, in practice, actually ensured that um, uh, names are removed from any documents. Uh, there's redactions if, it could, if the person could be identified um, through statement. Um, and also, um, support in terms of um, any, necess any needed um, uh, outside um, interventions which actually can be brought to bear um, in, in support of someone who has, who has suffered uh, such, um, such uh, behaviour towards them. <clears throat> I think that's very important and I think it's a, it's a really good question from that point of view because as we were talking about earlier, a lot of people are frightened of reporting anything because they don't know where that's going to leave them, and nor do they actually know um, whether or not they'll be um, left to deal with things on their own. And I think it's particularly important um, uh, that we do ensure that those who have had um, a misdemeanor uh, committed against them um, can have a full apology uh, for a start, that might not be enough, but a full apology is, is certainly a beginning. Um, and I think that apology should come from the person who's committed um, uh, the conduct. 
Uh, but also, I think, from the political party whom that person has represented, I think that's important as well. Um, and that the, that the individual does receive um, support from whichever um, body might be the most appropriate. That could be, as was mentioned, it could be um, by Rhoda, I think, actually, it could be rape crisis or it could be some other um, counselling office uh, which can help people. <clears throat> and also the person who has actually committed the misdemeanour should um, be offered some kind of uh, support to change their behaviour patterns as well because uh, we're not a court. Um, what we are is a, is a body of um, individuals who've come together for a particular cause and that cause is not to actually then, um, uh, you know, provide for a criminal uh, style of approach to terms of um, you, you're not imprisoning people. What we're doing is to try and bring this type of behaviour to an end and to also change the type of behaviour which some people have been, uh, have been indulging in. Just very, very quickly, um, our formal complaints procedure is anonymised, as is our confidential helpline, so that, that is totally anonymous for people to use. But I think it's important when people make informal complaints that, that they are put in the driving seat of that complaint, so it's up to them if they don't want their name known what, what action they want taken on their behalf. Given that this is an abuse of power, I think it's very important that the victim is empowered in the steps that they can take to put the situation right. Just to, just to say that the interim policy that I mentioned earlier, which is being put in place uh, during the, the redesign of, of our party's internal processes, uh, does go into uh, issues around confidentiality and data protection uh, in relation to sensitive information. The, the welfare and conduct officers currently being appointed uh, have access to external training, uh, which will support them to, to understand their responsibilities in that regard. But as I say, we're, we're still at the process of implementing this newly designed system. So uh, I, I would say that the, the, the one area we're not yet uh, being clear about is communicating how all of this works to our members, uh, whether in the parliamentary group here or our wider party members, uh, once the system is fully up and running. Uh, uh, that's that's obviously the the next point of of uh, of action is to communicate how people access it, how people can use it, and the the confidence that they should have in in doing so confidentially. Thank you, um, Jimmy. You want to come in? I did. Thank you, Kavina. Um I just wanted to ask how you balance the duty of care to the person uh, who is making the accusation uh, with the duty of care to the person who is being accused, particularly in relation to if they work in the same building, same office environment, and both would want to continue working in that um, in that environment. So how do you balance that duty of care to both? Yep, um, thank you. That's a particularly important question, actually, um, because as we were talking about um, people going forward were not hopefully in the vast majority of cases. In some cases, <clears throat> it may be that someone will leave the Scottish Parliament on, on the basis that they no longer can work there or wish to work there. Um, but uh, what we do need to have, as we were talking about earlier, is support for those people who have had, um, who have had um, um, behaviour, um, unfortunate uh, bad behaviour committed towards them, and also um, some kind of counselling behaviour for those who have actually committed that. Um, but on an everyday basis, this place is a certain size and shape and it's difficult to actually, you know, you, you're not going to be isolating people away from each other on a permanent basis or anything like that sort of thing. So it's important, though, that we do cooperate um, with the parliamentary authority to try and ensure that uh, people are not cheek by jowl um, as they go forward, that they do have a um, some degree of separation um, in order to allow for them to uh, particularly feel comfortable coming into work in future. Um, as I say, no party, I think, can actually 
do all of that by themselves. It is required that we will have to op uh, cooperate with um, the Chief Executive's Office, Presiding Officer, etc., in order to try and make sure that we can that we can have a, a a decent working environment for anyone who's suffered such um, behaviour against them. Um, and I know that the Scottish Parliament is willing to cooperate in doing so. I think I would say in general terms, the principal duty of care has to be to the person making the complaint in the first instance. But beyond that, I, I think it would be uh, a mistake to be too prescriptive. Different circumstances will apply if it's a if it's a complaint being raised informally and where the expectation is that uh, unacceptable behaviour is to be constructively challenged and changed and and learned from and understood. That's very different from a situation where there's a a much more serious action being complained about and a, a disciplinary process at a formal level being put into into practice. And again, it would be different if uh, if somebody was working here in in this building as opposed to. Uh, a very small number of people working together in a, in a local office, for example. So I think the, the important thing would be to judge uh, the situation on its own terms and to listen to the, to the needs and wishes of the person making the complaint in the first instance. We would be guided by you know, our pastoral care officer as to what would be appropriate for those circumstances, because I think Patrick's right, every, every case will be different. But I think to have a professional advisor who can say what would be appropriate in the circumstances we would find ourselves. Because I mean, for all we all work very closely together and we all perhaps want that to continue in, a, in an easiest way as possible. So actually having somebody professional who's slightly removed from it is perhaps the way to achieve that, that uh, approach. But we should also make sure that we do treat everybody appropriately and fairly and don't automatically assume that because somebody's been complained about that they're automatically uh, guilty and likewise uh, we shouldn't dismiss those who have complained so keeping the balance right is pretty difficult in the in, in many environments but that's what we've got to try and achieve Order. Takes me back to I think the, the issue I raised very early on in the questioning is if you're talking about an MSP and harassment of their own staff, you then are in a really difficult position because the Parliament, the structures in the Parliament don't really allow you to put things in place there because that is their employer. So you can't say, well, you don't have any contact with that person because you have no locus over their employment. Now, there's things you could obviously do, you know, if there were other MSPs in your group that had a staff vacancy, you would ask them to consider taking this person so that they could, you, you would protect their employment and move them on to work with somebody else. But you can't. You have no. You 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 have no ability to do that other than appealing to goodwill, and I think that is the real issue. And until we sort that out and find a way of dealing with that, people won't come forward because they will be worried about their job because they know there are no formal steps. You know, a business manager can take um, to to give them alternative employment and remove them from that situation. Um, and you know, he followed the process all the way through to dismissing the MSP if we had a, a, a way of doing that for gross misconduct, you're dismissing their employer. So mm -hmm. we, we have a really difficult uh, problem ahead of us and I think we need to give it serious thought and I hope the, the committee will do that to find a way around this so that we can provide that safety and confidence to people and um, that they can report in confidence and know that you know their future, their livelihood is not at stake. I think by having a kind of speedy, effective, confidential and commensurate process, then that ultimately helps to deliver for the duty of care for both individuals concerned. And you know, as some of my colleagues have highlighted, there is opportunities uh, based on each uh, individual case um, to ensure that that uh, process is carried out effectively, whether it's through um, an individual working for the group or uh, a, a different office, a different floor. There is, there is ways and means in which we can make sure that every uh, instance is treated with the utmost uh, care for both individuals concerned. 
Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the witnesses for coming along this morning and uh, providing us with uh, some very important evidence, I think, in terms of how the committee will consider its inquiry. Um, and I'll suspend briefly to allow the witnesses to leave. Uh, agenda item three is for the committee to consider the correspondence we've received from the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. Um, are we content to note the letter? Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, and now, as previously agreed, we'll move into private session. <laughs>